I made a little movie in New Jersey, and uh, the actor put the scenes that I had with him on his reel. And he happened to be in the Celebrity Basketball League with the director, Brad Furman. Hmm. And the actor I'm talking about is Eric Edibari. He plays, uh, you know, the, an accused rapist. Um, he shows his reel to Brad Furman, and Brad Furman, the director, says, that's Michael Perret, isn't it? He goes, yeah. He says, wow, can you get a hold of him? So Eric called me up and said, uh, can I give the director your phone number? So the director called me about an hour later and asked me to be in the movie. Oh, wow. And I said, it's coincidence because I had my agent had got me an audition for the movie a week had gone by. So hmm. when uh, Brad brought my name up to Tom Rosenberg, you know, the uh, the CEO of Lakeshore, he said, yeah, we like him. And uh, so between Brad and Tom, I got the job. So you were really impressed by Brad. I mean, you guys had a great working relationship, didn't you? Well, you know, he's he was a very passionate director. But, you know, there were those moments where he was like the calm in the storm, you know, because it was, it was you know, kind of a big production. They had three cameras going at all times. And, uh, you know, a big crew shooting in L.A., but, you know, when he spoke to you, you didn't get a sense of any anxiety or rush or pressure. It was like uh, a very, he had a very artsy side, but in the main, at the same time, you could see he was running this entire circus. And, uh, you know, I'll keep my fingers crossed, knock on wood, that we'll get to work together again. But what is it generally that you look for in your communication with a director? Because I know some actors want as little communication and, and specific direction as possible. But what do you look for? Well, it depends on the project, but you see there are so many characters in Lincoln Lawyer. Everybody mm -hmm. plays a certain note, you know, that uh, helps describe Matthew McConaughey. So if everybody doesn't play their particular note, you don't get much of a melody, right? And mm -hmm. Brad is a very musical guy, coincidentally, that uh, I think he understood that. Um you know, another actor might have said, you know, you've written him as my character, uh, Detective Curlin, as a very aggressive, pushy guy. And another actor might have said, well, you know, I want to show the, the more uh, friendly side of the character. And it's like, no, that's not this character's job in the story. Your job is to... You, you are, you, you do, as you say, act as kind of, you have an adversarial kind of relationship with McConaughey in the film. What What was that dynamic like between the two of you? What was he like to act across from well he's a great guy he's a great guy very relaxed very confident very uh congenial you know hung out um wasn't uh aloof he's a he's really a, a, a great guy he surfs you know he plays golf you know i surf so we had a little bit of conversation about surfing he made that great movie surfer dude you know mm -hmm. which every surfer saw so uh i got along with him really well when you're because this is a this is a bigger budgeted this is a big studio kind of project and yeah, you've done yeah, this, and this you've, was great man I've done a lot of little movies and uh, the difference between the quality of everything involved you know the amount of thought that went into the wardrobe and the fitting and there had to be certain cuts because cops wear guns and they don't want to look like uh, they're in a cheap suit because they're wearing their guns so you know. It was very uh, interesting how everything was so... Nothing got shot until everybody was happy. Is that the main benefit uh, of a bigger studio film compared to the smaller movies, uh, the benefit of time? Time, money, and real care. You know, um, Lakeshore makes movies that they're very... I mean, they got a bunch of Academy Awards, right? They don't, they're not they're just in... You know, their movies make money, but mm -hmm. they're they're trying to make great films. Right, so they're very careful in who they hire as the director, who they hire as the cast, who their cinema. You know, everything is chosen for a reason. It's not just the guy who gave them the best deal, and what actor will take a rate cut. You know, it's uh, right. no, we're going to get the guys that we want. You know, and we're going to make the movie we want because we want to make a great movie. Inspired you to get into acting? Was there a certain performer that that lit that spark in you? I was a, a, a movie fan all my life, but when I saw Montgomery Cliff and Jimmy Dean and Marlon Brando and Paul Newman and uh, Robert Mitchum, 
uh, when you when you see guys like that working, and, and it just seems like wow, you know, that's that's magic. These are like great artists. Um, that gave me a great respect for the craft. But um, you know, I was kind of thrown into it. You know, um, you know, you must have heard this because it's in every fucking biography that's ever been written about me. <laughs> you know, that a, an agent, you know, followed me into a bar for a couple. You know, it was a neighborhood bar in the Upper West Side a show business bar, and she just talked me into taking some acting classes, and I walked into acting class, and, you know, I was a cook at the time, and, uh, you know, you only got to talk to waitresses, but here's mm-hmm. all these beautiful girls in acting class, and suddenly they take you serious, you know, how to fucking cook. <laughs> you know, so that made me keep coming back to acting class, but I never thought I'd have a career until I met Joyce Selznick, and she put me on Greatest American Hero. Yeah. What was the great fit? I mean, what felt right about it to you? You know, I read, I think it was in Uta Hagen's book where, you know, the acting as if, where, you know, when I first started reading plays, I said, how, how the fuck do you make this stuff work? I mean, I don't get it. And then I, I read this book and it's, you have to make it as if you are in the story. You're not acting, pretending to be somebody, but you are somebody. And that just clicked in my mind. You know, it's not, you know, me pretending, it's me being, you know, Robert Duvall says the same thing, you know, he says, it's a craft, it's not fucking magic, man. Right, you know, right. you, you learn how to do certain things, you learn how to read it, you learn, read it from a certain perspective, and then uh, you just got to feel it. I wanted to ask you about just a couple of your your previous films, and uh, you know, I've always been, as many people are, uh, crazy about Eddie and the Cruisers, and, and that's actually pretty much like a, a big early break for you. It was my first movie. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the time of innocence. You know, mm-hmm. I was doing Greatest American Heroes, so I had, you know, plenty of income. I went off to New Jersey, and uh, it was strictly an act of art. You know, yeah. there was nothing. We weren't thinking about anything except making a great movie. Didn't You know, I didn't know about distribution and, and all that other stuff. It was just, I right, we're making a movie. Mm-hmm. And the cast in that movie. <laughs> yeah, Tom Barringer, Alan cat. Barkin, Joe Pantoliano. Oh, it's amazing. So, yeah. so when you say that that was the time of innocence for you, I mean, you've been acting for a long time. Does acting mean something different to you now than it did at the beginning? Well, you become much more aware of it as a business now. When you once you've got the job, you know you're back to that that clean part where, you know, it's just about acting. But, you know, a major part of acting is getting a fucking acting job. Right. You know, and when you're young, it's like, you know, I was, I think I was 23 or 24. It was like, you know, I didn't think about the future. It was just, uh, that was something that you'll worry about when you grow up, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got all the time in the world when you're young. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, but But with independent films as they are now, uh, and they have been for for many many years. Does that mean more opportunities? It means there's a lot more independent films now. There's a lot less because the DVD and blockbuster and you know all that that whole mid range market is pretty much disappearing. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, some people say there's going to be even more movies because there's going to be even more channels. But um, you know, I, I had a great run in the independent market. But what I was missing is, like, even in the beginning of that, I didn't realize that there was a difference between studios and independents. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't realize for years that, uh, geez, these movies I'm shooting in, in Africa and Israel aren't being uh, looked at like they are in the United States. Right, you know, right. A movie made by Lakeshore is worth 10, if not 20, of these independent movies I've made. Because because Lakeshore's movies will be seen. It could, I mean, by, well, yeah, by that, me. and they really care. You know, hmm? that pre-sale market, that pre-sale production, really ruined a lot of films. You know, because if they could pre-sell the movie for two and a half million and shoot it for a million and a half, they're in a million dollar profit, right? Yeah. So that's before they start shooting. So it's hard to tell those guys it's important we make a good movie. Because they said, "Why? Well, who gives a shit? We make a million dollars. Hurry up! Come on, mm-hmm. get this shit all done with. We've got six weeks, and we go home." With, with that in mind, though, when you do independent films and you have 
you know, two, two, three lot. week, two, three weeks to, to, to get it down. Uh, is there a benefit to that, that speed? I mean, you, you can't kind of question yourself. It has to come from the gut. Is there truth well, in that? You see, to do a good movie in that amount of time, everybody has to be on their game, you know, and, um, uh, Unfortunately, that's not always the case. You know, I made a, a movie, I think, called Dark World, and uh, we shot it in 15 days. But I knew the whole screenplay. I knew every fucking, you know, when I to get the job, I had to audition a 20-page schizophrenic breakdown where there's four other people I'm talking to, mm. right? <laughs> and I did it, and I got it. And then, and then, you know, and when we shot it, I get there and you find out we're shooting on short ends. So this 20 minute, you know, you know, off Broadway performance I gave is now a bunch of 30 second clips mm. because I kept running out of film. And you know, cut, pick up, cut, reload, pick up, cut, reload, pick up. And you know, when you have, uh, if you can imagine, a schizophrenic you know, nervous breakdown. I mean, it's a, it's a very complicated thing to go from complete cool to, uh, you know, a quivering, you know, blowing your brains out kind of thing. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, you kind of miss the value of that performance if you don't get it in one take. Well, mm -hmm. I could give them the whole performance in one take, but they didn't have enough film to shoot it in one take. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's what you're stuck with sometimes. You know, it was a, it was a brilliant fucking story. It was a great script. You know, but they just didn't have enough money to shoot it right. Uh, so you've seen so, that. You've seen that yeah, happen seen, a lot. I've that... seen you know complete fucking abortions of great stories, and then I've seen you know kind of crappy scripts made into great movies. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm I wanted to ask you about a couple of filmmakers that you work with, starting with uh, Walter Hill. Uh, tell me what what is Walter Hill like because he's. I, I don't read that many interviews with him. He's, but but I always love his films. He has he makes very like very tough tough films. But so what, what is yeah. he like personally? He's, he's, he's like he's a lot like the lead characters in his movies. Mm. You know he doesn't talk a lot. He's a, he's like a real uh, you know John Ford kind of guy. Um, I'll be honest. I was surprised I got that role because I didn't audition for it. You know I just met. Uh, Walter and Joel and uh, let's see I forget Diane was up for uh, A Fish Called Wanda not A Fish Called Wanda but Splash mm. and and who was the, the girl who did Splash Daryl Hannah Daryl Hannah right when I met Walter and Joel Daryl Hannah was going to do Streets of Fire mm. and Diane was going to do Splash and then they switched roles so I mean they gave me that job without really, you know. I was so fun. I was so young, you know. The I, you know, when we did Eddie and the Cruisers, we were like, you know, these five or six actors all in this little hotel. You know, we did two weeks of rehearsal, doing all this workshop stuff. You know, like you would do in, uh, you know, like you would do in HB Studios or something. You know, right. And then to get to Hollywood, and I said, so what do you think I should be doing here? And he said, just be a star. Just stand there and be a star. Don't worry about it. You know, and I'm like, well, fuck, man. <laughs> you can say that to Clint Eastwood or to Nick Nolte, but, you know, be a star? <laughs> and that kind of threw me. But that's, you know, Walter wasn't used to working with such young actors, I think. You know, when, when you look back and you realize everybody in that cast was under 30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Diane Lane got her final high school report card delivered to the makeup room. <laughs> oh, know? gosh. I mean, wow. imagine that. She says, oh, look, I got all these. <laughs> you know? There she is, the star of a $26 million movie. Uh, you've worked with a couple of, like Walter Hill, a couple of legends in terms of filmmaking. Like John Carpenter? John Carpenter was actually the name that came to mind, yeah. He was another great day. guy, a real, a real goddamn artist. But you see, I worked with John at the right time, you know, mm -hmm. because... Uh, I could really appreciate how great his screenplays are, you know, and it wasn't like, it, it, it didn't, I didn't have to figure anything out. I knew a lot more. I had a lot more experience when I worked with John Carpenter. You also worked regularly with uh, Uwe Boll, who we've, we've yeah. had on the show. Who, who, 
who is it? Yeah, he's he's a great guy. I mean, he's the most entertaining conversationalist you could <laughs> you could have you could have on a talk show. But uh, I mean, he he is definitely kind of misunderstood by a lot of the public. Don't don't you find? Well, you see, Uwe is you know he's got he's got two uh, advanced degrees. Uh, he has a doctorate either in economics or in German literature, and a master's in the other. You know what I mean? He has. He has advanced degrees in economics and literature. I don't know which is the doctorate and which is the master's. But he's a brilliant guy, and he also boxes. Hmm. You know, um, and his perception, you know, from, uh, because he was, let's see, he was born, I think, like in 1965, well after World War II, so he doesn't have any of that, but he grew up with that with the onus of being a German and having done the uh, the uh, Holocaust and, and all this other crap. Right. Um, and he ends up being like this, you know, um, bard, poet, warrior. I mean, he's made a bunch of these game movies, but he's also made a bunch of very serious movies that are, you know, social commentaries. You know, this thing that he did, Auschwitz, was Jesus, you know. How fucking yeah. daring for a German to make that! I, I I was there when he was making it, but you know there was there's was nothing for me in it. And uh, you know his other movie uh, Rampage, and uh, the one I did with him Seed. Uh, I was in Rampage, but it was you know gratuitous. But in Seed, and uh, in Postal, I mean this this is you know very interesting stuff. Yeah. But um, you know what can you say? He uh, he is definitely an artist, you know, and if people don't appreciate him now, they will. You know, if you look on the Internet, people have a lot of positive stuff to say about him. Another part of his problem is that, you know, he's pretty much told Hollywood distribution go fuck themselves from the mm-hmm. get-go. Mm-hmm. And they don't like that. <laughs> you know, so they're not going to be nice to him, you know. Well, those are the kind of guys that, because hearing you talk and about the people that inspire you and the people that you continue to work with, like Uva and, and an actor like Mitchum that really drew you into acting, you seem to like that kind of no-nonsense, authentic kind of artist. Well, you know, I, I, I like that to work with people who really have something to say, because I've worked with a bunch of directors that don't have much to say, that they're just executing the script, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a lot easier to work really hard on a project if you know the director thinks that he's doing something important. Mm-hmm. You know, because I've worked on them where it's like, I, you know, I just want to go home early. I, you know, I did a movie where the director came to me and said, I can't stand this this script of the music in this movie. I just, you know, wanted to make a big American movie. Hmm. You know, that was the sequel to Eddie and the Cruisers Part 2, They Hired a Canadian. And he came to me the day of the first rock and roll sequence, and he says, I can't stand this kind of music. This isn't my kind of music. I just hmm. wanted to make have, have fun and make a big American budget movie. And, you know, and I had to work with this guy for, you know, seven more weeks, knowing that he hated the fucking movie. But it was a big payday for him. And they had to use a Canadian director. You know, I don't. You can't print this, but I mean, the guy. I don't know if the guy ever fucking made another movie, but uh, you know, you're not supposed to say anything bad. But there are great directors, and there are guys who are just, you know, hacks. And I've worked with a whole spectrum of them, and I prefer mm-hmm. working with the guys who uh, think what they're doing is kind of important. 